Let's look together, can we please, here in Philippians chapter 3 for just a few moments. And as I often will encourage you on Sunday mornings, but I had the privilege today of passing out some Bibles to folks. We want everybody to have a Bible. Boy, if you come to our church, we'll get you a Bible. We want you to be able to open your Bible when it's time for preaching. We want you to see what's being said. We want you to be able to mark it up and make notes and write down the date that I preached from this passage so you can remind me two years from now when I'm back on it again. Okay, I, oh, I love that. I appreciate that so much. I'm kidding. Uh, Philippians is where we're at, Philippians chapter 3. But if you need a Bible, boy, if you'll see me or one of the gentlemen in the lobby tonight, we'd be glad for you to have one. And I want you to be able to follow along. Philippians chapter 3, and let's look together here. Let me pray with you very quickly, and then we'll go to this. Father, again, meet with us now as only you can. Lead us and direct us. And Lord, we know that you love us, and we know that you have a purpose for our lives. And I believe that uh, understanding that is developed through your word. Help us now in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, the majority of you were here this morning, and I appreciate that. Some of you didn't, weren't able to be here, and so I want to just review very quickly. We're looking here at this letter that the Lord used the Apostle Paul to write to the church in Philippi. The church in Philippi has the distinction of being the first New Testament church started in the continent of Europe. It's in a place that you and I would recognize as Greece. Philippi was a, an interesting city. It was known for gold mines and fresh springs. It was also known for being a Roman colony. They had rights as Roman citizens, and so that meant something to them. And so some of the terms that are used, we'll reference that as we look to this. The Lord used Paul to go there after he saw that vision, come over to Macedonia and help us, and he did. And the Lord did a great thing there. You remember that he first met a lady by the name of Lydia. She was a seller of purple. Then he met a little slave girl who he freed from the devils that were tormenting her. And when he did that, he messed with somebody's money. And when he messed with somebody's money, it got him and those that were with him in trouble they went to jail they were beaten and thrown in jail and at midnight the Bible says that the Apostle Paul sang and uh, prayed and praised the Lord and it was heard and the Lord shook that prison up and Paul was set free that jailer cried out in fear for what was to become of his life and that is the wonderful conversion of the uh, Philippian jailer we believe and it bears out that Luke was left behind to help this church get going probably meeting in that lady's home Lydia she seemed to be a lady of means and in business and so the Lord began to bless there they were a giving church and so there was four reasons that we see generally speaking that this letter was written number one to thank them for how they had given they gave of their finances they also gave of their body they sent somebody to help them and one of the things that I want us to do going forward I want us to send finances to people and then when there is need when people have need I want us to uh, pay for somebody in our church to be able to go to the mission field to help maybe it's an electrician to go and wire a building maybe it's a builder to help build a building um, who knows what it might be but we want to be sensitive to that we want to be able to help folks and that requires funding and that this church had given and they had given of themselves that also requires somebody being willing to go and it's not always easy to go right it, sometimes you have to spend some vacation time or you got to step outside of your comfort zone to go but imagine the shot in the arm that it is to a missionary on the mission field to have somebody in some church care enough to send to them to help them with their need and Paul thanked this church for that and he thanked them for that person so the letter was to thank them. It was also to tell them what had become of the person who brought their gift, that he had actually received that gift from that man, that that man had also been very sick, sick unto death. But he continued the course that he was called to do. It was also to warn them. And we saw that in chapter 3. Remember that verse, verse 2. Three times the word beware is used. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. And it seems like the fourth thing that we'll get to perhaps tonight was that there was a little bit of a disturbance in the church and it seemed like there was two ladies who were fussing and maybe even from that fussing there had become a little bit of a division in the church. And as I've said before and I'll say it again, it's not always ladies that fuss. I've pastored long enough now. It's men that fuss too, right? We can all get in the middle of that and everybody can, can stir things up. It just happened to be in that case the situation there okay and that uh, we want to be careful of the Lord's work we want to protect it and so this is the letter that's been given we've discussed things so far like for example the Apostle Paul helping the people to be like-minded and helping them to have a servant's mindset he expressed even in his own testimony what he had gone through and why he had gone through it that because of the bonds and because of the suffering that he had gone through the gospel was furthered and he was okay with that Paul said, whether it be in life or in death, whatever the Lord has for me, I'm comfortable with that as long as Christ is magnified in my body. And we saw that verse, chapter 1 and verse 21, for me to live is 
Christ and to die as gain, his purpose in living. Then we launched into Philippians chapter 2, where the directions were being then given to the folks that they were, if they had been comforted at all, if they'd been helped by the Lord and their salvation, and they had been, then they were to in return reflect that, and they were to live that. And there's where that verse comes in, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, the mind of Christ, and how he humbled himself and he became a servant and he was obedient unto God, even unto the death of the cross. And then he was exalted, right? And then the apostle Paul reminds them of their great purpose and why they needed to be like-minded, why they needed to be in unity, because they were a generation and they were a group of people living in a crooked and perverse nation. And they needed to hold forth the word of life. They needed to hold forth the truth of God. And if they were murmurings and disputings and fussings, then they would not be doing what they're supposed to do. And listen, just simply put, if we spend all of our time fussing with each other, we miss out on fighting the devil. And we want to fight him. We have a real enemy. We have real problems today. And God's people need to be unified around the gospel. We need to be engaged in this battle, engaged in this conflict. We need to be praying for each other. We need to recognize our work in this body and give it and put that effort out there because we have this great calling and this great purpose. And boy, we need to see that. I can't emphasize that enough. This is for real. This is eternity for people. It's life and death. There are people who will hear the gospel this week. We had a, just a tremendous, fruitful week this week in our soul winning and our ministry opportunities. We saw people saved Thursday morning and Thursday night. I got to see someone, as I mentioned to it this morning, lead folks to the Lord in the Swahili tongue. People who come to America from another country and able to get the gospel here from somebody. We're, this is big stuff. This is important today. Folks came in and they believed on the Lord. And folks came today and they got established in the Lord. And you and I have got to see the bigness of what we're a part of. This is not an Elks Lodge. It's not a Moose Lodge. This is the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his. It's so important. You get up to teach your lesson. You get up to sing. You ought to recognize the importance and the priority of what we're doing. Nothing more important, in my opinion, going on in the world today than what's happening when God's people are gathered together around the Word of God, being instructed, being built up, and being established in that. And I know the world's attention is on many things, but oftentimes on the wrong things. And our attention and our mindset is to be right. The Apostle Paul is drawing them to that, and then he gives them the example. He tells them about Timothy. He tells them about this fellow by the name of Aphroditus to give them testimony, to give them people that they could relate to, the people that they were around to see that. And how important is that in a local body for there to be Timothys and for there to be Aphroditus, those people who we can see and see them consistently and faithfully and graciously serving God. They help. They settle us. They settle us. And I'm so happy tonight. That in our church, the Lord has given us Timothys and Aphroditus and those who settle us and those who are faithful and those who are consistent. And I pastored the same people long enough now to have in heaven some Timothys and some Aphroditus that someday I'm going to get to heaven and we're going to have a grand reunion there. And it's going to be something else. And so then in Philippians chapter 3, he reminds them of the, what he had warned them of before, that there were people who had come in who were of the concision, and we laid that out, who they were trying to bring the people back under the law or to a law, uh, Jewish believers or Jewish folks who were wanting to Judaize or to take these Gentile converts and take them now from the simplicity that's in Christ and to add to that. And to complicate that, to frustrate the grace of God, the Apostle Paul then said, if anybody would have confidence in the flesh, it would be me. And he gives those eight things, and we looked at them last Sunday evening. He said, now that I know Christ, and when I came to know Christ, I counted all those things but loss. They don't measure. They don't measure me up to God. Am I a counting sheet of life? They don't matter anymore. He said, let's take it a step further. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He said, you know what, come to think of it, I don't want to count all those things but lost, but with my new accounting system that I have in Christ, I recognize that the knowledge and the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and who he is and his purpose for my life, everything else pales in comparison to that. And he said, the fact of the matter is, I've lost all things. But that's all right, because I count them but dung. They don't mean anything. Friend, if you live this life, in light of that knowledge of who Jesus is, as the Apostle Paul did, and you pursue Christ, what else matters? What else matters? 
And that's really the mindset that the Lord would like to develop in our hearts as well. As sure it was the Apostle Paul's. And then we touched on that, how he wanted to know the Lord and that he wanted to be found in him. We emphasized those things this morning. And then he made a statement. He said, I'm following after. And we talked about that pursuit of following after. The Apostle Paul said, I'm pressing toward the mark. And what was the mark that he was pressing towards? He was pressing towards Christ's likeness, to be like Jesus. We touched on that this morning. He wanted to be like Christ. And if anybody could say, I have apprehended that or I have Christ's likeness, I think it would be the Apostle Paul. Here he is sitting in jail. Here he is in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. Here it is, a man who's lost everything, who has been obedient and will be obedient even unto death. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, I have not made it. I have not achieved it. I have not arrived. He said, I want to apprehend that which I'm apprehended for. He said, I want to see in my life, simply put, I want everything that Jesus wants for me. I want it. I want to pursue that. That's what I'm driven to. I'm like an athlete. An athlete is pushing himself to do something, to win the gold medal, to be the fastest, to be the champion, the world champion, pursuing that. The Apostle Paul said, this is what I'm pursuing. This is what pushes me. This is what motivates me that I may win Christ. I want to win him. I want him to be pleased. I want to have his favor on my life. I want him to look upon my life and say, well done. That's what I'm pursuing. Who are you pursuing and what are you pursuing? Man, when we put it and make it all about Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, when we make it about him and we look to him, I find that submitting, I find that yielding, I find that allowing him to remove things from my life is so much easier than a preacher telling me what I'm supposed to throw out of my life. Now, we need preachers to help us, we need teachers to help us, we need parents to help us. But friend, when you kneel before Christ and the Lord says, listen, I want you to run this race that I've got for you, and I want you to get rid of this, it's a weight and it holds you back. I want you to get this out, it's a sin and it holds you back. We don't say, yes, preacher, we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, okay, that's what you want, that's what I'll do. I want to please you, I want to live for you. Verse 14, I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. And then he, one thing he did, he said, I forget those things. And we didn't develop it a whole lot this morning, but we talked about forgetting both good actions and bad actions and prior standing and never feeling like we have arrived. And until the Lord calls me home, I will not have arrived, right? Until this is changed, and someday this will be changed. And we'll see that this evening. And so with that, Paul said, you need to do something. You need to look at people who are following the Lord, who are following the right things, and you need to get with them. You need to follow that example. And Paul wasn't braggadocious in it. He didn't just say, follow me, but he said, look at this. Would you notice with me? He said, uh, so walk, so verse 17, walk so as ye have us for an example. It wasn't, he didn't, Paul didn't just say in this passage, follow me. He said, follow us, us. Hey, let us run the race. Let us who are like-minded, let us also have this mindset and these desires and make them our goal and our objective. Then the Apostle Paul said, but you know, you've got people around you to look to. Boy, that encourages me. That helps me to know the place of every person here, that there's somebody, when you and I are walking in, in the Spirit and following and pursuing the Lord, there is somebody, I assure you, who is helped by your testimony. They're learning, they're picking up, they're seeing your consistency, they're watching your expression of your faith as you live for the Lord, as you give to the Lord, and we're to follow that. Now listen, look me, uh, young people, look at me. If I look right up this way, young people, you've got a church full of people tonight who love you and who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are teaching and preaching and giving and providing opportunity they're providing lessons so that you can learn. Now, our job is to give it, live it. Your job is to receive it. It's like playing catch. I can throw the ball to you, but if you don't stick your hands out and catch it and receive it, then I'm going to hit you in the head with it. And you're going to wonder, why does you keep throwing stuff at me? But when you stick your hands out, you say, all right, I'm ready to receive it. Then you're involved in the process. And I sat for years in church, and the preacher was throwing balls at me, hitting me in the head. And I wonder why in the world is that guy always throwing stuff at me? Until finally, 
16 or 17, I'm not quite sure, years of age, but on a Sunday evening sitting in church, listening to the same preacher that I heard for many, many years, that evening I finally did something. I lifted up my hands and I caught what was being said. And I said, whoa, hold on a second. This is, that's pretty good. That's pretty good truth. I, I, I need that. I need that for my life. I need that for my direction. I need that for my foundation. I need that someday for my family. You can sit and listen as some people even sat and listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. But unless you stick up your hands and say, I'm ready to catch it, it's going to go over your head. And don't think for one moment that just because you've been around the right people and the right stuff and the right things, don't think for one moment that that's enough for your life and for the establishment of your life. I watched as folks who had so much truth given to them, so much truth thrown at them, and they just, I think to a point we become quite spoiled to it. It's like good cooking. You know when you understand that you've had good cooking? When you start getting bad cooking. And we have had in our life, young people, you have people who teach Sunday school, they teach you in junior church, they work with you in master's clubs, you got parents, you got those who are pulling to try to give you truth. But you got to get in the game. You got to catch it, you got to receive it, you got to listen, you got to be attentive, you got to say, hey, that's for me. And Paul said, listen, you've got all sorts of examples here that you can follow who are following the right things, you ought to follow them. But he said there are people who, and he labels them as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Does that mean that there were people who were physically standing up and saying, I'm an enemy of the cross of Christ? No. There are two general groups of people who are causing problems in the churches that Paul had been in. There were the Judaizers who were seeking to take away from the effectiveness of the cross by adding things to it. And when you add things to salvation, you are in opposition of the cross. They say, well, they're good people. They, they have a good direction. If you add anything to salvation, you take away from the cross. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with the cross. Don't mess with what it means. Don't mess with what Jesus did there. You confuse people. You complicate things. And we drive people away from the simplicity that is in the beautiful, beautiful work of the Lord Jesus Christ where he bore the punishment for our sins. You frustrate it. And we frustrate the cross, and we become enemies of the cross, and we add to salvation. We become enemies of the cross when we also, in the area of discipleship, as there were people who seek, sought to add to salvation, but then there were also Gentile folks who were coming along who expressed or exercised an exhausted liberty. There's one group who seeks to add to, and then there's another group who says anything's all right. And everything goes, and that is simply not the case. They grossly, grossly, grossly in error do not preach the whole counsel of God and or rightly divide truth. And that is why people who gather today in buildings that God's people have paid for over the years, heard things where allowance was made for grievous and gross sin that grieves God and destroys lives. So how do we get here? Well, listen, if you don't rightly divide the Word of God, then at some point it's going to come to anything. And that too then becomes an enemy of the cross because we're taught in discipleship that we're to do what and to follow the Lord? We're to take up our cross. Let this mind be in you. What am I to do with that? To be obedient even to the death of the cross. There is a part of Christianity that the Lord calls us to that is suffering. There is a part that calls us to, that tells us to come out from the world. We've read it here. We've seen it in the book of Philippians. And to preach and to teach that anything goes with the Lord in our service to the Lord that frustrates things and that complicates things. This is a generation that wants their cake and they want to eat it too. They want everything, the full package, right? 
They don't want to hear anything's wrong. They don't want to be told anything's wrong. They want to make excuse and allowance for everything. And where does that end up? It ends up with what we're getting. And give it 20 years, give it 30 years. But our, our, our grandchildren, we have, our oldest grandchild is a year. It seems like just yesterday our oldest child, who will turn 28 this month, was born. 28 years like that. What will it be like in 28 years? What will the churches, the teaching and the preaching, what will the direction be given where we're at? Now that requires of us, that requires of us that we can get a little bit of gumption down inside of us. I'm not saying to be creeps or to be punks or to have, be, uh, uh, have bad attitudes because we're not going to win people that way. But we have to stand in truth and we have to know what truth is. And we've got to dig in there. We can have grace and we can have truth. And we should have both. And Paul said, these are people, look at, there's four descriptions that are used here and I've got to hurry up. Number one, these people who are the enemies of the cross, the first thing is, whose end is what? Destruction. Whose God is their belly, appetites, what they want, right? And whose glory is in their shame. They glory in things that are actually shameful. They find uh, such glory and such recognition, such honor in that, and also who mind earthly things. Now, in those groups there that we've mentioned, and that crosses the board even still today, because there are religious people who have religiosity, right? They have big pomp and big circumstance, and they mind earthly things, and they're all about that. They're all about the appearance of religion, all about their windows, and they're all about their idols, and they're all about their structures and their forms of things. They mind earthly things. They're more interested in their position. They're more interested in who the boss is and who gets the notoriety, who gets the attention of things than they are in the truth. There's the extreme whose appetite, whose God is their belly, and they, whatever they want, whatever their appetite is for, whatever it's flavored towards, that's the direction they go in. Their shame, that thing that they find pride in and there, is their shame in that. And those that would have a work salvation where they would say, I'm working my way to God, that's a shame. It doesn't work that way. And the Apostle Paul dealt with that. These are people who are called what enemies of the cross, and what are we to do with them? We're to mark them. We're to know this. We're to be clear about this. We need to see the end of their, their teaching and the end of their doctrine. Now I want you to look at verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation is in heaven. Does that mean that when I'm speaking here that I'm com having a conversation with somebody in heaven? What's the Bible talking about here? This term conversation, and it's a good word. There's nothing wrong with the word. We don't need to change the word we don't change the Word of God. We let the Word of God change us, but I, sometimes I need to understand a word. And that word conversation comes from a word that deals with politics. Our conversation. One might say that that conversation is referencing like our citizenship, like who we are. We're different than the people in this world. We're different than this world. We are God's people. And I think it bears out because if you'll look and see what the Bible says in the next verse, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who shall what? Change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto the glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Aren't you thankful that someday this is a vile body? This old vile body is going to be changed someday. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 deals with this, that I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to see him, and I'm going to be like him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 57, they deal with this also. I'm getting a glorified body. And the best part of that glorified body, oftentimes they say, no more aches, no more pains, no more this, no more that. No, no more sin. No more of this, no more of those frustrations, no more of the complications that come from sin in this vile body. Oh, listen, it's to a certain extent I appreciate what a glorified body means. I appreciate what heaven is, you know, what there's not in heaven. But th there's a whole lot more to that topic than just what there's not. And you and I, as we begin to grow and develop, they sang it this morning in the 9 o'clock service, the sweet hour of prayer, and then the last verse is still from Mount Pisgah's lofty heights. 
I see my home and do what? Take my flight. What am I going to do? I'm going to drop this. Well, won't that be something? No more fussing, no more fighting, no more lust, no more temptation. None of that stuff dealt with. That's why as we live for the Lord, as we press toward the mark and we try to subdue and to bring in subjection the flesh and we try to yield to the Lord, boy, there's that battle that rages. At least there ought to be. And that's what causes us to say, man, someday I'll be so glad this is done. And so we're told that our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for what? We're looking for Jesus. We're looking for that same Jesus that went up in the book of Acts. We're looking for that same Jesus to come back for us. And when we see him, those that are asleep and those that remain will be caught up together with them in the air, right? And so shall we ever be. And when that takes place, man, oh man, what a moment. Amen. That sealed deal when you got saved and the Holy Spirit moved in and that redemption was sealed, it will come to pass. That'll be the final purchase of that. And you're going to look around, I'm going to look around, and we're going to say, man, this is great. This is wonderful. Not just that the aches and pains are gone, but we're like Jesus. And now we get to worship the Lamb and live for Him. Preacher, do you understand everything about that? Nope. But it sure sounds good. I don't understand everything about good cooking, but I know when it tastes good. And that tastes pretty good to me. Now in Philippians chapter 4, very quickly, could we go there? And so these folks are being instructed to know and to follow right examples and to receive the things that were being taught to them. And they were reminded that there were others besides Paul that they could look to. They saw the end of those who would try to lead them astray, those that would overemphasize grace and, and liberty and uh, abuse that. And then also those of the circumcision who would seek to bring them back under the law. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. First nine verses are going to deal with something, going to deal with the peace of God. The peace of God. Look with verse 9 very quickly and then we'll come back to it. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Look at it again. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. What's the key to that passage? That's what we were talking about a moment ago. Received. We threw it at you. Now you've got to pick it up. We gave it to you. Paul says you've received it. We've taught it. We showed it. You've seen it in me. I've lived it. Now you need to do it. And if you'll do that, and there's a promise here. What's the promise? And the God of peace shall be with you. This is not to say that as a believer, God is not with you. All right? You can't take one verse and all of a sudden throw everything else you know about Scripture out, out the window. What it's suggesting to is believers who are obedient, who are following and pursuing the Lord, will understand and recognize the presence of God and the peace of their God in a real and genuine way that others do not experience. There are people tonight who I believe have been saved. They came to Calvary, they recognized their need for Christ, they accepted Christ, and their name is written in heaven, and they have that part of it cared for. But they have not grown, they have not developed, they are still as a church in Corinth was carnal, and they do not understand or recognize in their life the peace of God. That's why everything's an up, uh, uh, up, uh, upheaval. Everything's turned up. Everything's a problem. Everything's a stirred up. And nothing, always anxious, always moving on and stirred, and always worried, and always this and that. And I'm reminded of that psalm, Great peace have they, what? Which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That doesn't mean that God is not with them. When you get saved, he moves in. But what the Lord is wanting for you is not just that you would have the peace of your salvation, but he would like for you to have your life described as being a life of a tranquil state. That doesn't mean you don't have problems. The man that God used to write this is the king of problems. Paul wasn't sitting somewhere on a tropical island, sitting in a lawn chair and enjoying the good life. He was where? He was imprisoned. 
Paul looked at himself in the mirror that he might have had, and he saw his face disfigured from having rocks thrown at him. He looked at his back in the mirror, and he saw scars from being beaten multiple times. So listen, when this guy says to us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is a peace and a God of peace who wants to hover and rest in your life and over your life, then we need to listen. I need the peace of God. Not only that, I want the presence of God, the God of peace, to be all over my life. I want that for my children because restless people become nervous people. And restless and nervous people, they struggle. And some of us are wired a little differently, right? Some folks look at things, and they see the glass half full, and they say, oh, man, the glass is half full. Some people look at it and say, oh, man, the glass is half empty. Some people look outside and see the sun shining bright and say, oh, no, I'm going to get sunburned. Right? Others look at it and say, it's going to be a beautiful day. Some people get upset about some things and others do not. Some folks don't get upset enough over things they ought to get upset over, right? But regardless of who you are and your temperament, and that's forged and formed in many ways, God and the peace of God, God wants you to have. And that is something that we can have in unity and experience, and we should. And I believe with all of my heart that you and I, and especially our children and our grandchildren, if they continue to pursue the things of God, they're going to come up against things that are going to be unsettling. They're going to have to know the peace of God. They're going to have to be developed in that. So I've got to know what this passage tells me about peace because I, I need that. I need that. I thought when I was a boy that all I ever wanted to do was get my driver's license and drive. Right? Right? And then I started paying for car insurance. And then I started putting gas in my car. And I can remember driving to high school and pulling over in the Speedway gas station, getting my breakfast of champions, vanilla zingers, <laughs> Nestle Quick Milk. My mom and dad didn't know what I was getting, or a hostess fruit pie to go along with that. And getting gas in my 1974 Chevy El Camino at 79 cents a gallon. Have you looked at it lately? Well, that ought to be a public outcry about that because it's not, it's, you're getting gouged. You got politicians who are, who are playing games with you in there and all that. And that affects the working person. You want to know what hits people hard is, the, is gas prices. Everything about your life, look at gas prices and see where they go, all right? I'll get, I'll get off that rabbit trail, okay? But we could go there for a while if you wanted to. We won't. And I remember getting in that car and thinking, man, this is just going to be the greatest thing. I said, okay, the next stage, I got my car, I got my driver's license, now I got to get me a wife. I'll get me a wife. I got me a wife. Then I said, I got to get me a house. I got me a house. It was mobile. <laughs> that means you could hook it up behind a truck and move it if you needed to, right? I was living, man. Got married. This is great. All of a sudden, I got bills. Car insurance bill still came. Electric bill still came. Or started to come. The gas bill started to come. And this thing started. Said, All right, next stage, have kids. It'll get better. It'll, get, it'll smooth out. <laughs> then we had one. I said, if we had two, it'd be smoother. So we had two. If we have three, it'll be even smoother. Three, four. We're getting there. It's going to smooth out. Five, six. I said, hold on a second. It took me all this time to figure this out, right? And I thought, I tell you what we'll do, we'll get the kids raised and then. <laughs> right, and then you get to that stage in life where all of a sudden, physically, you begin to have issues and you begin to think about things. Look, you're going to have problems in life. That's a natural, that's a natural thing. You're pushing against problems. What you and I have got and who we've got is to bring peace into our life. It's not the absence of problems that brings peace. It's the one who is the God of peace who brings peace. That's why when you get that word, it's cancer. When you receive that word, you've lost your job. When you receive that word regarding your child, we have a little one this evening actually at the hospital seemingly recovering, little Miles. We hear those things, we run to, to the peace of God the God of peace, and we find our settling there. I don't know how many trials you're going to have. I don't know how many problems you're going to have, but I know this. 
I know the God of peace wants to give to you the peace of God which passeth understanding. Now what have I, I want to know. Could we just go till 8 o'clock tonight? You don't mean it, but uh, I will not rush through this. It's far too important to do that. And I want you to see in verse 1 here very quickly. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. Do you love God's people that way? You see, one of the ways you have unity, one of the ways you continue to maintain that and develop that is to love each other. Dearly what? Dearly beloved and longed for. My joy and crown. What do you think the crown is of ministry? The crown of ministry is not structures. The crown of ministry is God's people. It's people getting saved. It's people being discipled. It's people growing. It's people going forward for the Lord. So oftentimes we get a wrong idea of what success is. What is success in your Sunday school class? Success in your Sunday school class is not necessarily the number of people you have, although I want your class to grow. But success in your Sunday school class is the people that you're loving, that you're developing, that they're growing, that they're moving forward for the Lord. That's success. But we have a God who's an adder and a multiplier. And I think if you do what you're supposed to do, God will bring you what, who He wants you to have, and that'll be fine. But what is success? I lay my head down on a Sunday night. I don't say it was a successful day because of the number of people who were in attendance. It was a successful day because Christ was exalted or glorified because God's people were fed, God's people were helped, God's people encouraged each other. That's a successful day. And I don't know how to say this without, you know, and I want you to take this in, in the sincerest way, but you are my joy. You are my crown. You're what I'm living for. You are, as a pastor, towards God's people. That's to be the heart. When you stand up in front of your Sunday school class, you ought to be thinking and praying and loving those people and recognize these are the ones that you're laboring for. This is satisfaction in life. This is God's flock, and this is God entrusting those people to you. And someday you're going to stand before Jesus. And how you've handled the people of God and those that God's entrusted to you. Oh, how important is it? And how we should love each other. And how there should be that commitment. And the Apostle Paul says to this church, I long for you. I think about you. I pray for you. I desire that you, that you would grow. I, I want you to know truth. I, I care about you. I joy in you. I, I find value. I find my value and my service in you. Now I want you to look at verse 2. I beseech Eodius and I beseech Syntica that they be of the same mind in the Lord. You know, that's how you get over things. You get in the same mind of the Lord. And you're going to see this expression throughout this passage, in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. That's how you deal with things, in the Lord. We make it about the Lord and we keep it about the Lord. It's hard to stay aggravated and irritated, even in your marriage. You ought to make it about the Lord. The Lord puts you together. You've got a testimony. You've got an example that's to be for the Lord, in the Lord. I just don't know how I can forgive him. I just don't know how I could ever trust him again or trust her again in the Lord. In the Lord. We, we trust the Lord. We yield in the Lord. I can't tell you the number of times I've said to folks, listen, I don't know how you could trust him. I don't know how you could trust her again, but you can trust the Lord. You can be obedient to him. Uh, well, I just don't feel like they're sorry enough. Nobody's ever going to be sorry enough. Nobody's ever going to get it just right the way you want it. So you might as well just recognize it's in the Lord and let's move on for Jesus. And I think that these were ladies were good ladies. One of the names means fragrance. I, I, I think that they were probably pleasant ladies. I think that they were probably uh, pulling and wanting maybe even the right things. But something had happened between them, and it was strong enough and needed enough that the Apostle Paul said, hey, I want you to tell these gals we need them to be in the same mind here in the Lord. And then in verse 3, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, not, somebody not by name, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Uh, these are people collectively who have been involved and been engaged in the gospel process, who are in the Lord, whose names that will be described as being written in the book of life. These are saved people who are having issues. And he's saying, listen, I need you to help them. I need you to work with them. I need you not to give up on them. I need you not to 
push it off or push it away, but work with this thing and try to get these folks back on board. You know, the greatest testimonies of grace are when we work through complicated matters, when we're patient with each other, when we're forbearing. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about not dealing with sin. I'm talking about issues and matters that at times come between people. And I could give you a list if you wanted, but I'll not, of things that cause problems between people. Children cause problems between people. Money, I'm giving you the list, aren't I? <laughs> Over these years, I've seen things that cause a rub. People who have a different opinion of something. People have a different direction of something. People have a different personality. These are things that cause problems. One person's more laid back than another. One person wants attention. One person does eh, So many things could give you there. But the bottom line is we bring it all in the subjection of what? In the Lord. These are people we're going to spend eternity with. Now, I believe this. I believe the Lord has a sense of humor. And I believe if you can't figure out how to get along with God's people here, He's going to move you up into heaven. He's going to put you on the street with everybody you fussed with. <laughs> now, if you don't want to live next to Him for an eternity, I'm kidding. All right, they're lighting up there, all right? Well, we should, shouldn't we? That means the pastor should be tempered by that, right? In the Lord. That means church staff. That means members in the church. We're in the Lord, and we want to not divide, but we want to go forward. And uh, with that, I'll give you three thoughts and I'm done. Number one, we are called to stand firm. Notice with me. So stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord. We're called to stand fast in the faith, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. We're to stand fast in the liberty that Christ has given to us, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. We're to stand fast in one spirit, striving for the gospel, Philippians 1 and verse 27. Here we're directed to stand fast in the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15 would tell us to stand fast in the teachings and the doctrines that we've received. We're to stand fast. Now look, I'm through, and I mean it. Finally, hey, Paul uses it twice. I can use it at least a couple times, right? It, it, we've got to stand fast, and we can't let things that happen between us separate us where we lose our effectiveness for the Lord. Why? Because we're that, that crowd. We're that group that's supposed to be holding forth the word of life. And we've got to be like-minded. We've got to have the mind of Christ, but not to have our mind on ourselves, but have it on each other and helping and loving and being willing to forgive and being able to go on. Sometimes we go on a little different. That doesn't mean we have to irritate and aggravate each other. It, does, it means sometimes that we, maybe we shouldn't be as close or operate in the same arena together but we can still be a part of the same body together and not harbor ill will and not talk about each other in an unkind way. We can be gracious to each other. Why? Because we're a part of something. And what we're a part of is important because Jesus is important and the gospel is important and it's far bigger than me. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God and the instruction that we receive. Help us now, Lord to do business with you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We've covered a lot of stuff this evening. I'm wondering tonight if there are any young people who would say, you know what, preacher? You're throwing it, and I want to receive it. I want to, as Paul instructed those folks, I, I don't want to just hear truth. I want to hear it. I want to follow it. I want to live it. I want, to, I want it to be stated of my life as well. Who, what young person here would say, preacher, I want to receive the things that folks are trying to give to me and teach me about God. Preacher, my heart is to receive those things. Would you raise your hand? Wonderful young people. I hope you always be tender to that and be sensitive to that and to desire that. You come to church, you come with a heart that's open and ready to receive the Word of God. You go home, you listen to your parents, and you be ready for that. So important for your life in Christ. I'm wondering who's here this evening to say, Preacher, there was something in that today and this evening perhaps for me from the book of Philippians, the Lord's dealing with my heart. Would you lift your hand and say, Preacher, there was something in that for me. The Lord's using it in my life. Very good. Could we for just a moment have an invitation? We'll not drag it out. We'll do business with the Lord. The Lord's touching your heart and dealing with you in a manner. You respond to Him. Let's stand to our feet. Could we please? We'll have our pianist play. The altar is open to you. Come quick now. Don't drag it out. Let's get on with things here.